we had lots of dress-up parties in the frame when I was growing up. And this is a little handkerchief purse that she made me out of her favorite handkerchiefs. I can't pass it around, but I do have a picture of me in this red velvet coat pushing my baby brother William. Don't you love his name? William Holden. <laughs> We're on our way to church. I'm going to pass this around for you to look at. And church was beautiful, Emmanuel Episcopal Church. I even have a picture of it that I will share as well. I'll pass this around. Emmanuel Church was um, started 10 years before I was born. It's still there today. And it's called the Mother Church of the West Tennessee Diocese because it was the first church west of the Tennessee River. Such a beautiful church. I understand that they're still hosting a fall festival on a Saturday in October, and that it is still not to be missed. I remember a letter that Papa wrote me for my 10th birthday with words of wisdom to read and reread for many years. I hope that you'll listen very carefully to Papa's letter. You might learn something. He was such a lovely father. My darling Anna, you are turning 10 years old today. Your beloved mom and I are so very, very proud of you for all that you have done already in your young life. And I know that you will continue to please God and to make your family proud of you for many years to come. Mom and I want you, sweet Anna, to continue to find joy in the journey that God has set before you. There are so many words of wisdom that I could share with you, but the best words for me to plant in your heart come straight from the Holy Bible that we read each night. Please carry them in your heart for the rest of your days. I am paraphrasing our King James Version because I truly want you to understand the words of Romans 12, verses 11 and 12. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Be joyful because you have hope. Be patient when trouble comes. Be faithful in prayer. And of course, dear Anna, when life gets tough, and believe me, it will, be sure to keep this verse from Joshua 1, verse 9, close to your heart. Remember that I commanded you to be strong and brave, so don't be afraid. The Lord your God will be with you everywhere you go. It is my prayer, Anna, that you will encourage others with the spirit of joy and the spirit of optimism. And I pray that you will always see goodness and give thanks in all things. Always know that your mom and I love you very, very much, precious Anna. Happy birthday from your devoted papa. Well, as you can tell, I was blessed to have the world's greatest papa. Such a godly man who practiced what he preached. Oh my, I have such fond memories of growing up in beautiful LaGrange. How much I love to read books. And it was especially fun to write in what Nana called my thankful book. And I have that with me today. I've been writing in it for many, many years. One day, I remember I was ever more thankful for a hug from my baby brother William when he took his first step. And then he reached out to me and gave me a hug. Really grateful to have got to ride Papa's sleigh that cold, snowy January afternoon, making um, muscadine, chilling with Mom in the summertime, even when it was hot. I still love doing it. Listening to Papa read Bible stories as we were cozying up by the warm fire in the winter, and I remember taking John and Willie and my brothers. On a wheelbarrow ride, Papa's wooden wheelbarrow. I think you get the idea. I had a lot of things to be grateful for. On days when things were not going so well, Nana reminded me to read and reread my thankful book. And you know what? Soon I realized just how blessed I really was. And my problems of the day would soon shrink at least a little bit. Perhaps you should all try writing in a thankful book. Nana always said, gratitude turns what you have into enough. 
Our lives, however, turned completely upside down on September the 16th, 1853. This makes me sad thinking about it. At the age of 40, my beautiful mom, and Eliza Wilkins Holden died. And then six weeks later, my youngest baby brother, Emmett, died at the age of 18 months. Oh, how I loved and miss my mom and my brother. Papa said we should be sad, and, and we would continue to miss them, but we should be oh so grateful for the times that we had with them. Oh, and all those beautiful memories that we would always have in our hearts. This is the prayer that Papa prayed for me. Loving Jesus, we pray today for all who are God, especially for Mama and for baby Emma. For you know, God, how much we love them both. We believe that they are with you in heaven, safe within your loving arms, and that one day we will see both of them there. Until then, we ask that you hold Mama and baby Emma close to your heart. Amen. As you can imagine, a lot of my time was spent helping Nana and Papa with my younger siblings. Some say that helped me to become a teacher as I started when I was 11 years old. Um, in four years, at the age of 15, I was able to start college at um, the Grange Female College. And I graduated in four years with a degree in education, which enabled me to teach in LaGrange, in Holly Springs, and later here in Collierville. By the way, this is Mama's favorite jacket that I have on. And this was her favorite hat with the cherries in the back. Papa saved these for me. And whenever I wear them, I think of my precious mom. And through the years, I've moved these cherries to various hats. I just love it on this one because this was actually Mama's hat. Well, in the fall of 1859, my cousin Mary and her delightful mama from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, came to visit us in LaGrange for two whole weeks. Mary and I were both 17. At the time, we had no idea what was getting ready to happen in our country. We so enjoyed our cousins from the north. Oh, I remember a beautiful thank you letter that Cousin Mary wrote me after her visit on October the 2nd, 1859. From her letter, you may find out what the definition of hospitality is, but range style. My dear cousin Anna, I cannot begin to tell you your precious Nana and oh, your so kind Papa, cousin John to my family. What a very lovely time Mother and I had staying with you in your beautiful town of LaGrange. My first trip to the South was a dream come true. My Papa has always believed that traveling is the best and most enjoyable form of education, and I wholeheartedly agree. Attending the symphony concert performed at Emmanuel Episcopal Church, the classical ballet of the Great Female College, the Fox Hunt and Brunch at Jones Plantation, and the outdoor barbecue picnic given in our honor at the lovely home named Tierra, all made for the perfect visit. Your friends outdid themselves, Anna. Mother and I truly appreciate such Southern hospitality. As 1 Peter 4, 9 says, offer hospitality to one another without complaining. And believe me, I never heard anyone complain. In fact, Father and I agree that hospitality is truly a spiritual gift, alive and well in the Grange, Tennessee. We hope to return the favor to you one day when you have time to travel a bit. We would love you to stay with us in Philadelphia and visit the many interesting historical sites pertaining to our country's beginning. Again, let me say thank you, dear cousin Anna. My memories of our visit to the South will always remain with me and put a smile on my face. I pray that you and your family will be happy and healthy always. Warmest regards and love to you and your family, Cousin Mary. Well, I'm afraid that all of those lovely parties and the concerts, the ballets, they soon ended. Before long, Papa started smelling trouble coming to our little town. He decided it was a wonderful idea for me to leave LaGrange. 
and go to nearby Jones Plantation and take a teaching job there. Where thankfully, I lived for four years during those terrible times that were really ravaged our country from 1861 all the way to 1865. Some of you may have visited that plantation. Today, it's called Ames Plantation. Folks come from all over to the National Bird Dog Field Trials that are held there. And the University of Tennessee, they tell me, now owns Ames Plantation. While back in the day, my two brothers, John and William, and of course my papa, loved to go raccoon hunting there for many years with their favorite hunting dogs, Maisie and Mimi. Oh, they are just two of many lunatic hounds that can be found in these parts. To give you an idea of what was going on in LaGrange, listen carefully to the words in the letter that Papa sent me during these four years. June 14, 1862. My dearest Anna, I do hope you're enjoying your time at Jones Plantation. I know the children are blessed to have you as a teacher. You're such a thoughtful and loving young lady. I am ever more thankful that you are safe and sound and not here in the Grange. Since yesterday, Union troops have taken possession of the town, and they say they'll stay no matter what until the end of the war. I heard one of their generals say that because the town is on such a high bluff and connected so well by railroad, it makes a natural military outpost. Folks around town are saying that by now, there are at least 40,000 Yankee soldiers here in our little town. They've taken our Emanuel Church and are using it for what they call a depot of ordnance. Several skirmishes have taken place near here, so when needed, they've started tearing out the pews and using them for coffins to bury dead soldiers. One of your favorite homes, Woodlawn, is now the West Tennessee headquarters for Union General William T. Sherman and Hancock Hall, who was just finished in 1857, is now home to U.S. General Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia. I hope to hear from you soon, my precious Anna. Remember to start your daily prayers, as I do, with thank you, God, for the gift of life, for the gift of health, and for your precious son, Jesus Christ, your loving and always devoted Papa. And now to give you an idea of what was going on in Collierville during the war years, a letter from my tolly cousin, Sarah, who lived here in Collierville on a street that is today called Hillwood Lane. It's just two blocks north of here. By the way, the Collierville Depot that she will mention was then located near today's water tower near Mount Pleasant Road, not far from here. The little caretaker's house that she mentions that address is 110 Hillwood Lane. It is still standing today. And some people call it Ancient Oaks, they tell me. Now, the big farmhouse that she'll mention was built on the highest hill on the farm. It faced Poplar at that time. And it would be 145 Hillwood Lane. Whilst you, Cousin Sarah, is reading, I'm going to pass around several treasures that have been discovered on Hillwood Lane through the years because all these Yankee soldiers were camping out on that farm. Please don't lift the lid, just peek through the clear top and be very careful with them. Lots of bullets and horseshoes. My dear cousin Anna, I have so much news to share with you. Carterville is now under Union occupation. We've been told that Confederate soldiers, under the command of General Chalmers, advanced from their base in Oxford, Mississippi, to attack the Union garrison at the Carnival Depot. General Chalmers wanted to approach from the south and cut the telegraph lines, burn the railroad trestles, and surround the battle fort. The battle started, they say, about 10 a.m., and the Confederates attacked from all sides. General Chalmers was quite confident of the Union surrender, but events turned at 12 o'clock noon when a train carrying none other than the Union General Sherman arrived quite unexpectedly from Memphis with Union reinforcements. 
It seems Sherman was planning to simply pass through Carnesville. But when he saw the commotion, he ordered the train to stop and call for reinforcements. Well, dear Anne, it seems the battle around the fort and the depot went on for about five long hours. Fearing more Union troops were coming from nearby Germantown, our Confederates withdrew. However, it seems some of our brave boys in gray stole Sherman's favorite horse, named Dolly, from one of the train cars. And it is then that Sherman gave the order to torch the whole town of Carterville. And so, Anna, most of the houses and stores in our lovely little farming village were burned to the ground. And that is why we have moved in with Uncle Henry and Aunt Carrie at their farm 15 miles out from Carterville. Because, and I'm crying as I heard this, our beautiful Gilwood place was burned to the ground. And we were forced out at gunpoint and the Union soldiers lived there, I was told, for quite a while, and camped out all over the Marmalade before the final burning We've received news that the caretaker's house is still standing. Perhaps someday we will move back into that little caretaker's house and rebuild the farmhouse on the hilltop. Hoping to hear from you soon, Cousin Anna. God bless us all. Your loving cousin, Sarah. You'll have to join me one day at the town square and we'll take a walking history tour sponsored by Main Street Carnival. You'll learn many more details about life during the 1860s in Carnival. Let's just all take a deep breath. Woo! Let's jump ahead to 1873 when I finally moved to this little village of Carnival to teach at Bellevue Female College. It's like it was located right down the street where the University of Memphis's Carterville campus and the Carterville Schools Administration Building is located. Right there on College Street. I'm so happy there's finally a college on College Street again. Well, Carterville was very different back in the 1870s. Folks were literally trying to rise from the ashes. For years after the war, the citizens of Carterville struggled to build and make a town once again. Oh, I have such fond memories of a beautiful two-story bandstand located in the new town square, which is where your town square is today. Oh, those fabulous concerts in the spring, summer, and fall. It is amazing how much beautiful music the soul. Yes, things were finally on the upswing. Lots of construction going on. And then, like a thief in the night, the yellow fever epidemic spread all the way from Memphis to Carnival, killing so many of our citizens. It was so bad at one time, there were not enough well people to bury the dead. Perhaps you'll join me one day again at the town square for the Yellow Fever Tour of 1878, also sponsored by Main Street Carnival. We will walk the streets around the square and hear lots of details about what life was like in the 1870s in our little town. Today, a delightful newspaper gentleman, Mr. Jones, is visiting with us. He's going to share some actual avalanche newspaper quotes explaining some of these trying days of yellow fever. The avalanche, September 18, 1878. Dr. P.A. Perkins Sr., his wife and son, are all victims of the, of the dreadful yellow fever. Dr. Perkins, the tall, Roman form of a man, has gone to the tomb on September 12th, followed by his lovely wife and talented son. All three spirits have knocked at the door of eternity. The Avalanche, September 19, 1878. Cairoville has made a request to the Howard Association to visit Cairoville as soon as possible. This benevolent organization, created in New Orleans back in 1855, gives aid to victims of during yellow fever epidemics. They send professional nurses and doctors to help care for the sick, feed the hungry, set up orphanages, pick up dead bodies from homes, and see to burying the dead. 
Presently, the majestic Peabody Hotel at Maine, Monroe, and Memphis continues to house the Howards, as they are called. They wear Howard Association armbands and travel to neighboring towns with mule wagons filled with provisions. Each doctor carries a knife, as well as his own pocket watch for taking the patient with pulse. And since there are no druggists left in town, the doctors carry their own arsenic tonic, bottles of gin, tonic water, morphine, iodine, and of course, castor oil. The avalanche, October 1st, 1878. And now our town marshal, A.J. Hall, has been stricken. He was said to truly be a hero. How, diligent, how diligent, diligently he has worked night and day since the fever began. Sadly, he has died and will be buried at Magnolia Cemetery with his gold star badge on his chest. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And now I have a letter that I wrote while living here in Collierville in 1878 to my brothers in LaGrange. Dear John and William, I've had no word about the yellow fever in LaGrange, so all I can do is pray that it will never reach LaGrange, that your families will stay well. Dear brothers, when the fever hit Collierville, it really hit hard. People began fleeing in all directions. I've heard at least 51 families have already left town. Of the 1,200 who lived here at the beginning of the summer, there are only 200 of us left. Dear brothers, I just cannot make myself leave. I feel a true calling to stay and help those who are sick. Remember what Nana always taught us. Life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. And with strength, encouragement, and guidance from our Heavenly Father, that is what I'm doing. I've moved temporarily to the Mango Home to help nurse victims of the fever who are hanging by a thread for dear life. Joe and Mary Louisa and their children, like so many people of means, have fled. But Joe was kind enough to offer us his home as a makeshift hospital. He's even paid for all of the expenses and said to help ourselves to all provisions in the house. Thanks be to God, Nurse Elizabeth from the Howard Association has just moved into the Mangum home to help us. She says that gin mixed with tonic water will ward off the yellow fever. She insists we consume one gin mixed with tonic water every afternoon. And it seems to be working. Those of us serving as nurses are exhausted, but we have not come down with the fever. We have, however, already gone through Jim Adams' supply. But she said that Dr. Smith from the Howard Association will be coming soon to Carnival on a mule wagon. He will bring us several bottles for medicinal purposes only, of course. Oh, my dear brothers, one of my patients has just passed away, so I must close this letter. It's my duty to drag her clothing and bed sheets into the street to be burned. Please pray for better days ahead for all of us. Your loving sister, Anna. <coughs> Once again, let's take a deep breath. <laughs> Finally, we were able to have church services again at the Mangum Home, and I was able to start teaching again at Bellevue Finger College in the late fall of 1878, when the yellow fever finally died away. Oh, we had a heavy frost, I remember, late that fall, and mysteriously, the yellow fever went away. I have a photo of Bellevue Female College and the dormitory that I'll pass around, which is right down the street. Well, my dear Papa about this time died peacefully in his sleep at the ripe old age of 70. My brothers John and William decided to start <coughs> new lives in Collierville, and you know, they probably wanted to look after their big sister in this little town. They first opened a mercantile business on the brand new town square, and then they had a much 
dreamed about schoolhouse built for me. Weren't they the sweetest brothers ever? I'm going to pass my, a picture of my schoolhouse now. It's so lovely. Today it would be 325 South Berlin, just down the street. We opened school in 1881. Years later, my school building and the Bellevue College building became the property of Shelby County. With the boys attending in my school building and girls in the Bellevue building. Well, after the original Victorian Bellevue building burned, the schools became one. In 1905, a beautiful brick building was built where the Carter Schools Administration building is now. The brand new school is appropriately named, and guess what? The Carterville School. It was the only one. And my schoolhouse that you're passing the picture around right now, uh, South Rolette, became the family home for none other than William Holden and his whole family, his wife and several children. It may be hard for you to believe, but by 1886, there were once again about 1,200 people in Cairoville. And let me tell you, that was a lot of folks back then. Because our St. Andrew's congregation was growing all the time, we started meeting in other locations because we'd outgrown the name of home. Then we ended up meeting for eight years in my schoolhouse in South Rowett. Before long, we were outgrowing my schoolhouse, and we started talking about building a new church. In 1888, this parcel of land where you're sitting today was purchased from the Gavin family for a whopping $200. That was a lot of money in 1888. I'll ask our newspaper gentleman, Mr. Jones, to read a paragraph from an article that was written about this time. Hardships of the destruction of the war, reconstruction, and the yellow fever epidemic still existed in Cairo. But the determination of a small group of faith-filled Episcopalians to build a church in Cairo persevered. Doesn't that give you the goosebumps? Faith-filled Episcopalians. And now it was up to church members to actually raise the money to build a church building. So guess what we did? We thought of the most interesting thing to do. We mailed, I'm going to pass this around, we mailed little postcards that resembled bricks to every Episcopal church that we could find in the United States of America. We asked them to purchase 50 bricks at 10 cents per brick for a total, you guessed it, $5. Well, donations started pouring in from all around. My brother John was the treasurer, so I know all about it. I will ask our newspaper gentleman to read something that was also published about our raising money for the new church. It has been determined that one railroad president, the leading industrialist, and the head of one of Wall Street's largest banking firms have all made substantial donations to this little Episcopal church they hope to build in Cairo, Tennessee. Can you even imagine how exciting we when all of this money was pouring in? We don't know for sure, but some folks said that those fellows that make such wonderful contributions, you know, they went above the Mason Dixon line. We think maybe they knew that this little town was torched during the war. Maybe they felt a little bit guilty and compelled to help us. Could I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> this fundraiser, along with various other things, such as selling tickets to musical concerts at my schoolhouse, enabled us to build this lovely Victorian Gothic church, which is, has been called a classic addition to the town of Carnival, for a total cost, drum roll please, $3,000. <laughs> In 1890, the cornerstone was laid on April the 22nd. Oh, I remember like it was yesterday, it was raining cats and dogs, but what a marvelous crowd we had. We didn't let that dampen our spirits at all. We were so happy to finally be placing the cornerstone. 
It was a solid piece of limestone, about 19 inches by 27. The face was carved with a cross and a date, 1890. Now remember, a cornerstone is also symbolic because Jesus is called the cornerstone of Christianity. Just as with any cornerstone, it serves as the base or foundation upon which beginnings take form. Now, inside the cornerstone, we place this rather heavy lead box. I'm going to pass this around. Be very careful. The top is down in it. That's the actual lead box. We treat it as if it were a time capsule. We put in various things so that in a um, hundred years, church members could open it up and learn about the early days of the church. Well, they tell me that church members took the box, everything in it, to the University of Memphis in the anthropology department, placed different pieces in a chemical solution, hoping to salvage a few things. They definitely could tell there was a penny from 1890 and a church medallion and probably some of the information that's on the history marker outside and a program for the cornerstone ceremony. It was wrapped, they think, in a piece of leather. But guess what? They also found two tablespoons of water. So scientifically, they described everything as kind of mushy. At the Centennial Celebration in 1991, and some of you may have been here, church members sealed what you call something called microfilm and other artifacts like a 1991 penny, and they made a new time capsule for members to uncover in 2091. Does anyone think they'll be here in 2091? <laughs> if you are, be sure and come in and see what they do. <laughs> now let's get back to the actual church building. This church is built, as you can see, in the form of the cross with pointed arches and beautiful warm wood tones. The window above the altar is affectionately called the Jesus window. The four medallions represent the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One of the most important symbolic elements which makes this building different from other buildings is that these stained glass windows were designed to control the amount of light that comes into the building. That's why one of the lights very low so you can see the natural sunlight coming through the stained glass windows. This creates an awareness of God and a desire for prayer and meditation. Don't you just love that? Look back here at the entry of our church. Those are Victorian Gothic 12 foot double doors with two stained glass windows called the transom window and the Bible window above the double doors. The round circles in the transom when they're all referred to as butt shots. They start as small balls of glass. They are fired into the forms that you see in this window. Now the breathtaking windows along the north and south sides of the building contain eight stained glass 13-inch medallions. These medallions were donated by our Episcopal Bishop. Charles Todd Quintard, who obtained them after attending a special conference with the Archbishop of Canterbury in England. How exciting is that? These exquisite and quite rare medallions are actually French in origin. They reflect the rich use of colors in the making of stained glass in France in the 1800s. And now my cousin Sarah, who started learning about these windows in my Sunday school class when she was a young girl, will tell you all about these magnificent windows. Our eight historic windows are symbolic of the key elements of the Christian faith. The dove, with an olive sprig, is a symbol for the great flood. It stands for peace, forgiveness, and anticipation of new life. The crown, stands for kingship. Jesus received his crown of victory when he ascended. 
the anchor is one of the oldest of all symbols of our blessed Savior. The anchor is always shown so that it forms a cross. The anchor cross is the symbol of our hope in Jesus Christ. The chalice, which symbolizes the faith or worship, is a godly shaped wine glass in which Jesus drank with his disciples during the Last Supper. The crossed keys are symbols of the Apostle Peter recalling his confession and our Lord's gift to him of the keys of the kingdom. The sickle and several stalks of wheat stand for the harvesting of wheat as food and the bounty of God in thanksgiving. And the sheep of wheat, with wheat being the familiar ingredient of bread, symbolizes Jesus who said, I am the bread of life. And finally, the cluster of grapes signifies the wine, the sacrament of the Holy Communion. Oh my, I guess you're wondering where that window is. The cluster of grapes window was originally placed where the side door now stands. It was moved around the corner right beside the organ. Perhaps you can peek at it when our service ends. <coughs> Thank you so much, darling cousin Sarah, but she's always the smartest student in my Sunday school class. Very, very special window that was placed in the church in 1890 a medallion inserted in 1970. It's the small window to the left of the great 12 foot doors. This window has its own connection to a little fella who often said, I love St. Andrews and St. Andrews loves me. Every time you look at this window, you should be reminded of a precious little boy named Michael Odell Dennefield who served as the bell ringer of St. Andrews. Michael was the son of a family from Georgia. He brought him in the late 1960s to Memphis for treatment at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital for Leukemias. It was at this hospital that Henry and Betty Mitchell, who were members of St. Andrews, befriended the young boy and his family while doing some volunteer work at the hospital. For two years, they brought Michael and his family often to their farm near Cordova and to St. Andrews for Sunday services. Michael loved this church. He wanted to serve as a torch bearer or as an acolyte. He was just not strong enough due to his illness and, of course, his treatment. But they tell me that our priest, Father Dargan, and Henry Mitchell tell them he could have the all-important job of helping them ring the bell at the beginning and at the end of the service. Michael loved his new job, and he was even asked by Mrs. Beth Lewis to ring the bell at her daughter's wedding. I have a photo of Michael with the bride, Barbara Lewis Porter. I'll pass that around. Michael was baptized on Palm Sunday, March the 30th, 1969, by Father Dargan. Sadly, Michael died in 1970. In April of that year, the Mitchell family had the bell medallion added to the small window, along with an engraved plaque right below it, dedicated to the memory of this precious young fellow will always be remembered as our bell ringer. Michael may not have been healed physically, but you better believe he was healed spiritually. They tell me that he truly found the love of Jesus in this special place called St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. And as an added note, I've been told that we should all be thankful for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital nearby in Memphis are now finding so many cures for cancer. I was even told of a young lady who was diagnosed with the same leukemia that Michael had when she was five years old. Well, guess what? She's in her late 30s, cancer-free, living a wonderful life. I've also been told that Michael Benefield loved to sing the song that most of us know, Jesus Loves Me. 
We're going to all sing the first verse and refrain with Vernon, and then he will sing the remaining verses in one refrain at the end. I want you to think about the words and think about Michael Benefield, our bell reader. Right side that is only pulled at funerals. 
There's a plate inside the veil that produces a red sand or silver sand. I've been told that through the years the veil has gotten stuck a time or two, and the fire department had to come to the rescue. Our bell weighs 350 pounds, and it was one of four in the old part of, near the town square in the late 1800s. There's a Methodist church right behind us, Presbyterian church across the street, and the Christian church at the corner of Poplar and Main Street. They all had bells to sound the call to worship. Well, there's a funny story about Helen Mangum an early member of St. Andrews, she told them that on Halloween or just any time we could see in the church, little Christers would come in and ring the bell. They thought they were being just terrible. Well, from her house on Natchez Street, she could tell which church bell was being rung. The pranksters didn't realize that the bells had different sayings. <coughs> so not to worry, the mothers of Collier will always knew where their little pranksters were. They got caught every time. I know it's kind of hot today, but some of you may be curious about how we stay cool in the winter months. You want to look back there on either side of the door. There were two large coal stoves that kept us mighty warm. Look way up high, you can see the painted bricks of the chimneys. And of course, to cool the buildings, we opened the windows and we used lots of handheld measures. <laughs> I understand now you have central, something called air condition and central heat, and it's coming through floor vents. I love this air conditioning. You may not think it's terribly cool to me, but it's really cool in this building. For many, many years, I taught Sunday school on these yellow pine pews, and I, I, we taught it, by the way, on Sunday afternoon. I taught my Sunday school folks that everybody is on his way away somewhere. Thankfully, we as Christians have a definite goal. The design of this church leads us on a clear path from the very first step that you take when you walk in the door all the way to God at the altar. The center aisle is always open. Please look straight up and you'll notice that where you're sitting, called the nave, which is Latin for ship, actually looks like a ship, doesn't it? This protects us from the storms of life. The nave represents life in the world. Up from the nave, always upward toward God, is the chancel, often separated from the nave by an architectural feature such as carved wood. The chancel represents life in paradise. Upward from the chancel is the sanctuary or the holy place, separated by the altar rail is the bar of judgment separating us from God. As you know, we stretch our hands over the altar rail to receive Holy Communion. The sanctuary, altar area, represents the final admission to the presence of God. Another interesting thing to know about is that we have three steps right here ascending from the nave to the chancel. These represent the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Next time you take communion, you can think about that as you're climbing the steps. Now, I'm sure some of you may be wondering how we came up with the name of the church. Well, many of our founding members were of Scottish descent. And St. Andrew, as you probably know, is the patron saint of Scotland. It was the easy choice. Oh. Following the crucifixion of Christ, Andrew preached until he too was crucified in Greece. He wanted his cross to be different from the cross of Jesus. That is why you see the X on the St. Andrew's flag and logo, the flag of Scotland, and even the Union Jack flag. Now remember, look at this room. When we built the church, what you see in this room was the entire church. That's why I taught Sunday school on the yellow pine pews on Sunday afternoon. 
Through the years, there have been several additions. We now include a delightful parish called next door with a state-of-the-art kitchen they count. Upstairs Sunday school classes and another attached wing to with offices. The list just goes on and on. We tell that a local artist named Pam Hassler, who lives right down the street, designed this very large stained glass window in the entrance hall of the building next door. You'll notice it, it all the ladies will notice it when you go into the parish hall, and you gentlemen can notice it when you walk outside. I must tell you, he is one of the founding members of this church. I am thrilled that St. Andrews continues to meet in its original location. In fact, I understand it's the only church with any part or with an active congregation that remains at its original site near the town square. And boy, St. Andrews is growing and growing. I'm been told you have two services now on Sunday and one on Saturday. There's one today, they said, at 5 o'clock. Tons of Sunday school classes, Bible study classes, morning and evening prayer services, special events all year long. There seems to be something for everybody in this church. As you leave here today, it is my prayer that you will do what my precious Papa asked me to do many years ago, and I believe it's written in your program. May you encourage others with the spirit of joy and the spirit of optimism. May you always see goodness and give thanks in all things. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and visit with you today. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, most of you remember, this is Elizabeth Parr, a popular uh, resident of this town and a member of this parish for many years. Ms. Elizabeth died in 2011 at the right young age of 103. Well, guess what? She actually knew Ms. Anna Holden well. She said that Miss Anna was such a lovely lady who had long dark hair pulled back on top and that she often wore one of her mini hats, especially a favorite straw hat with cherries attached to the back. She also shared that Miss Anna was a beloved member of two communities, her hometown of LaGrange and her adopted hometown of Carterville. Mrs. Park concluded that Miss Anna Holden was thoughtful and wise touched so many hearts with her compassion as she taught school for 55 years and volunteered countless hours at this church. Ms. Anna was truly the embodiment of grace. On April 15, 1921, Ms. Anna Holden died peacefully in her sleep at the age of 78. An article relating her death reported that she made a splendid uh, record in the schools. Quote, leaving the impression of her noble and unselfish character on many of the men and women of this state, end quote. In addition to the funeral service at her beloved St. Andrews, a community memorial service was held at the Carnival School, where the Anna Holden Scholarship Loan Fund was established in her honor. Students bought nickels and dimes, and friends and relatives made generous donations. A sum of $2,000 was given her name to Peabody College in Nashville. She is buried in Magnolia Cemetery, just a few blocks from here. The epitaph on her simple headstone reads, she hath done what she could. That's from Mark 14, 8. 